Hi, Pastor Steve here. I want to thank you for listening today, and I want to encourage you because I know that God will truly bless you as you study His Word. So hey, let's get started. Good morning and welcome to Lawrence Heights Christian Church. At this time, let's all stand together as we sing.
Good morning, church family. Summer is a great time for so many things. Uh, barbecues, going to the pool, and garage sales, just to name a few. My family is planning to have a garage sale soon, and I'm actually pretty excited for it. Uh, we should bring in a little bit of revenue, but that's not what excites me most. What excites me most is to be able to get rid of some stuff in our home that we no longer want or need. Um, I'm not sure about you, but in our house, uh, stuff accumulates quickly when we aren't paying attention to it. In a small way, a uh, garage sale gives you an opportunity to simplify your life. The things you get rid of, you'll no longer have to see or think about. You and your home will feel refreshed. I believe communion offers a similar opportunity to get rid of some things that we don't need and focus on Christ and once again be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's unfortunate how quick our lives, uh, like our homes and storage rooms, can fill up with things that we don't need, things that distract us from hearing God's voice. And since we fill up with these things so quick, we must often and regularly assess our lives uh, and clean out what we don't need. Uh, doing so makes more room for Jesus, more time for prayer, more time for fellowship, um, and also a clear conscience. Our time and thoughts are no longer focused on uh, the clutter that fills our hearts, and with this extra energy, we can dedicate ourselves to focusing on God and his plans. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourself treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures, on, treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. During communion, we should examine our hearts, admit our sins, and ask the Lord to help take away the things that we do not need to simplify our life so that there can be more room for him. And we can also ask the Holy Spirit to fill ourselves with his fruit, with love, joy, peace, patience, faithfulness, and the rest. Communion is also a time where we can simply thank Jesus for his sacrifice, because without his sacrifice, we would simply have no hope. But because of Christ's sacrifice, we have hope for this life, true purpose here on earth, and hope for eternal life with Christ in heaven. So this summer, as we work to declutter our homes, I pray we also make time to declutter our hearts and make more room for God. Here at Lawrence Heights, we practice open communion, and we invite anyone who's um, accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior to partake with us. In a moment, the uh, communion tray will be extended to you. Uh, please take a stack of two cups. The bread is in a cup underneath the juice. And know that special care was used in preparation. Lord, let's pray. Lord, we come before you thankful. We are thankful for your sacrifice that allows us to enter into a relationship with you and receive salvation as your free gift. We come before you humbled, confessing that you are our Lord and Savior. Lord, on earth, few things seem reliable, but we know we can always trust and rely upon your sacrifice for us. As we take this bread and the juice, may we remember your sacrifice. Help us to live a life worthy of your calling until you return. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I'll stand.
Hey, before they get very far, let's show our appreciation again to our praise team leading us in worship this morning. Thank you so much. And once again, good morning to you, church family. How are we doing today? Good. Well, it's great to see your faces. And for those of you in our online community, we want to welcome you as well. And if you happen to be a guest here in the house, we want to extend a very special welcome to you and invite you to just plug right in and make yourself right at home. Listen, regardless of your background or your current situation, we're just delighted that you're here because we believe that there's a perfect place here for you to belong, to plug in and connect, and to use your talents to glorify Christ. Hopefully you grabbed one of these on your way in, one of these bulletins. It's packed full of information, opportunities for you to connect and engage here with the body of Christ. I'll also direct your attention to that little tear-off connections card there on the side and invite you to fill out a little bit of information. Let us know how we can best meet your ministry needs. And then for your convenience, all you got to do is just tear it right out and you can leave it back there in the back of the tray on your way out. Now, in our time of Bible study today, we're going to be jumping back into our study in Mark's Gospel, where we've been for several weeks now, walking through it together, verse by verse and chapter by chapter. So if you've got your Bible nearby or your Bible app, I'm going to invite you to begin making your way to Mark chapter 7, there on the New Testament side of your Bible. As you can see there in your notes and on the screen, in addition to Mark 7, I'll invite you to mark your place in Psalm 51, on the Old Testament side for quick reference there as well. And as you're making your way to those starting spots, just a reminder and a challenge to you to get in the story of what God's doing here in this church. We want to invite you to, to take that next step. So if you're here today and you're not an official member, then become one. It's time. Or if you've been sitting on the sidelines for a while, it's time for you to get back in the game and use your talents to glorify the Lord as you serve others. Or if you'd like to know more about our small groups that are starting back up this fall, listen, it is a beautiful thing to be known in community, but also to serve others here in the church. Again, we just want to use that connect card there or even see me after the service to talk about what that next step for you might be. But now we want to pray. We want to ask God to speak directly to us through his word today. So together, let's ask the Holy Spirit to be present and at work here right now. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are here. We invite you to speak to our hearts and minds in a way that well, that might actually surprise us. But we've come here today with all kinds of things from this past week, as well as a lot of things we've got to figure out for this week. But, Father, here in this present moment, would you please just take away all those distractions and help us to give you our undivided attention. Father, please speak directly into our hearts and our souls and fill us with a deep sense of your presence and your work in our lives as you mold us and shape us into the church that you would have us to be. This is our prayer, Lord. We pray it now in Jesus' name. And together, all those in agreement said, Amen. 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 Again, if you're new around here, we've been journeying through this book, the Gospel of Mark. Mark is writing his account of Jesus. And remember, he's writing down everything that Peter saw. And throughout the book, Mark's getting us to ask the question, who is Jesus? Jesus. Chapter after chapter, he's unfolding a little bit more about the nature and the character of Jesus. And today, we're going to read some things that, well, they really might not make a whole lot of sense to us here in 2021. Things about defilement and about being clean or unclean or pure or impure. And even though we might not fully understand what it was like back then, God is still going to give us some very powerful applications from these 2,000-year-old traditions, like the fact that Jesus is the God who can make us clean. So this morning, we're going to jump right into a conversation that Jesus is going to have with the religious leaders about what makes somebody clean or unclean. Let's pick it up together. Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. There we read, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. Verse 3, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the traditions of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean 
hands. Let's stop right there for a moment. These Pharisees and religious teachers have traveled 90 miles together as a delegation to talk to Jesus. And not just to talk to him, but also to point out all the things that he and his disciples were doing wrong. The religious leaders of the day were suspicious of Jesus. They were quite critical of his ministry because, in case you don't know this, Jesus loves to mess with your religiosity, doesn't he? At the time, people are, were coming up with their own religious ideas about how God is, and Jesus just totally loved to mess with that. And here we're going to see he's going to mess with the idea of what they've called pure and impure, clean or unclean, defiled or undefiled. He's also going to talk about the word tradition like five times in this very short passage. You see, the Pharisees were really into their traditions. They were really into this whole idea of washing. They actually had 65 pages in the Mishnah about ceremonial washing alone. Now, to be clear, this isn't a hygiene issue here. No, it was a tradition built upon a tradition that was built upon other traditions. And in our time together today, we're going to see that these traditions had become so pervasive and so powerful that they actually became like law. The only way that you could connect with God was to wash and wash and wash. So listen, if you're a, a clean freak here today or a germaphobe, you totally love the Pharisees and what they were saying back in the day. But let's just stop for a minute and think about traditions and how they get started in the first place. Because Typically, traditions start out with something good, right? But then traditions can kind of morph into something that's actually counter to what the whole original idea was. For example, let's look at Thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but Thanksgiving is one of my most favorite holidays. You get together with family and friends. There's all this incredible food. You talk about all that you're grateful for, maybe even play some games outside or watch some football on TV. But more and more in recent years, well, it seems like what was intended as a time to pause and take time out to give thanks to God has now become something totally different. Hey, what's the best price I can get on a big screen TV? Or hey, let's leave Thanksgiving early so we can get up at 4 a.m. to go stand in line for more junk that I don't really need after just saying how grateful I was for everything that I already have. So instead of giving thanks, we got to buy, 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 because why? Because we're not really content. What's happening here? Well, again, a tradition that started out really good can ultimately lose its way and become the opposite of what was intended. So when the Pharisees wanted to keep clean hands, where did that come from? Well, it actually came from a very good intention. In fact, David articulated this passion for the people of God to have clean hands back in Psalm 24. There he asked two questions. One, who can stand on God's holy mountain? And two, who could stand in the holy presence of God? Those were the two questions. And the answer was, those who have clean hands and a pure heart. So the Pharisees took that idea and they just kept adding more and more on top of it until eventually their ideas and their traditions became more important than the original heart of the commandment. So now as we move into verse 6, they take it even further. Take a look. And here's how we know that Jesus did never read Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Here's how we know. He's about to say some things that are pretty shocking. In fact, if you're new to church and you think, oh, Jesus, he was always so gentle and compassionate. He never had a mean or harsh word to say to anybody. Well, buckle up, buttercup, because he had some very direct things to say to people who took God's word and used it to create some kind of barrier between people and God. Check out his response to this delegation that has come 90 miles to point out all the faults of Jesus' disciples. He replied, verse 6, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he's not done. Verse 9. He said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But, verse 11, you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is Corban, that is a gift devoted to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Wow, he's not messing around, is he? 
Now, again, words like defilement or Corban here, they may not really resonate with us today. But what Jesus is saying here is that they were putting the traditions above the law and the heart of God. And he says, you guys do lots of stuff like that. Now, let me just ask, aren't you guys grateful that we aren't like those Pharisees today? We don't ever do stuff like that, do we? Or maybe we're more like the Pharisees than we would care to admit. Yeah, we also do many things like that, where we know what God's word says, but we still create our own traditions anyway, our own way of doing things. Listen, it's important for each of us to understand what Jeremiah 17, 9 says. The human heart is wicked and deceitful above all things. It's beyond cure. Who can understand it? In other words, your own heart can trick you. It can totally deceive you, so much so that you can look at the Pharisees now and say, thank God I'm not like them, which ironically is the exact same prayer that the Pharisees prayed. Thank God I'm not like that other person. So Jesus can take those traditions and he's going to reveal something that's so powerful here to us in 2021. For example, what's this whole idea of Corbin? Well, Jesus was pointing out the fact that they had so many traditions that basically invalidated God's word. Most of us know that God's word says that you should honor your father and mother, but the Pharisees, they had another tradition. You see, if you wanted to take your house and dedicate it to God, then you could say that your house was Corbin. So now if your parents wanted to come visit, you would tell them they actually would have to stay at a hotel because your house has been devoted to God. And in that tradition that they created, it violated the commandment to honor your parents and to take care of them. And Jesus said, that's just one of many things that they did like that. So what does that tell us about what the human heart does when we create traditions that just serve our own purposes? Well, if you're a note taker here this morning, you could write down this simple idea. Point number one there in your notes, we have an infinite capacity to rationalize our sin. We have an infinite capacity to justify our own actions, actions that make us look clean on the outside, but in reality, we're unclean. We're quite good as a people at looking for loopholes and laws or commands or the heart of God that we don't really want to follow. Like, for example, I doubt that any of you declared your property to be Corbin, but when you did your taxes this year, Maybe you were thinking, you know, I really don't like our government. I certainly don't trust our government. And I really don't like what our government's going to do with my money. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to change a few of these numbers here and keep some of this money for myself. So by an act of dishonesty and fraud and deceit, you've justified your behavior because you didn't want something else to happen. And at first, maybe you felt a sense of conviction, like, you know, this is wrong. It's not the truth. And I'm a Christian after all. But before long, that feeling of conviction just kind of faded away. And now you're almost bragging among your friends about how you're sticking it to the man, right? Or maybe for you, it's a relationship. And you're thinking, you know what? It, it, it's okay because, you know, we are going to get married someday. Sure, we're living together, and I know that's not what God wants, but you know what? Our situation is just a little bit different than other people's. I, I'm sure God understands because we're under his grace and all, right? Again, you felt some conviction about it at first, but then you rationalized it by saying, well, everybody's doing it these days, and we're not as bad as that other couple over there, so we're good, right? Or how about this one, Steve? Yeah, that whole thing about generosity, about giving God my first and my best. Well, here's what I'm thinking. I'm going to take all this stimulus money, and I'm just going to spend it on myself, and then eventually, sometime down the road, eventually I'll give some to the church, or eventually I'll help the poor. Or Maybe even, you know what, I really don't trust the church. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep it in a separate account, and I'm going to find a way to just stay in control of that money. We even rationalize spiritual things, which is what we see happening here in Mark chapter 7. So when Jesus said Isaiah was right when he talked about you, you hypocrites, what did he mean by that? Well, quite literally, it means you actors, you pretenders. It's almost like an identity thief who takes somebody else's identity and then uses it for their own purposes. Jesus said, you guys are using God's name to sanction your own behavior, even behavior that's wicked and unspiritual. Again, we've got to ask the question, do we ever do stuff like that? Well, as the people of God, we need to be very careful to not look at a command of God and say, you know what, I know what God says, but for my situation, here's what I think, or here's what I believe. 
I mean, here's one of those little lies that Satan whispers in our ears. People say this to me all the time. Pastor, I was praying in my prayer closet, and in that prayer, this is what God said to me. God said to me that he wants me to be happy. So I'm leaving my husband, or I'm leaving my wife, or I'm blank. You fill in the blank. Again, you've taken the word of God and you've placed it behind your back and then you're claiming that God said something in order to justify or feel good about some sinful behavior. Christian, listen, that is not what it means to follow Jesus. Sadly, we do this all the time. And the Pharisees, they were doing this with spiritual things. In fact, if you want to read one of the most scathing monologues of Jesus, then read Matthew chapter 23 on your own for homework. Just read what Jesus had to say about Pharisees. He said that they were washing the outside of the cup, but the inside was still dirty. He actually called them whitewashed tombs. He said that they looked really good on the outside, but they were totally dead on the inside. He also had a lot to say about people who used his name to justify their own behavior and then to judge everybody else. So as the people of God 2,000 years later, listen, we need to be so sober-minded. Because here's the deal. It's fairly easy to disobey the commands of God and still appear to be super spiritual or super religious, which is exactly what the Pharisees were doing here. I don't know, maybe for you, it's what version of the Bible you read. In fact, you even get angry or you judge people who read a different translation. Or maybe for you, it's the style of worship music that you love. Yeah, Steve, why can't this church just sing that style of music that I love? Again, now you're angry and now you're judging. Or maybe it's the style of clothes you wear. Yeah, Steve, looking around, things are way too casual around here. I mean, you're preaching. You should be in a full suit and tie. You got jeans on today, guy. Again, listen, that's a preference. That's a tradition that's not found anywhere in Scripture. Yet, because it's become more important to you than actually loving people who are all around you, that has become your tradition. That has actually made you like the Pharisee. Sometimes the word sounds so spiritual. You know what? Only God can judge me, preacher, which is true. But in reality, that's code for, you know what? Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And I'm immune to anybody's feedback. I'm going to live my life however I want. Another one that sounds so beautiful on the surface. Listen, Steve, I don't trust in man. I only trust in God. But you've just created a culture of victimhood. Victimhood has become your identity. So now you can judge everybody else, but no one can correct you, right? Be very, very careful, Christian. Don't hide behind those popular phrases or traditions that put you in opposition to God or to his church or to his word because that's what was going on here. And Jesus called it hypocrisy. And it was creating a barrier between people and God. Now listen, obeying the commands of God is certainly important. It really is. But the Bible itself is not primarily just about moral compliance where God says to do something and we should do it. No, so much more than that. You see, it's about a relationship. Jesus said, if you love me, then keep my commands. Let's stop and think for a moment. Think about when you first fall in love, what do you do? You study that person, what they like, what they don't like, their preferences, what would bless them, what would put a smile on their face. And if you love somebody, then you're eager to do those things. Why? Because you want to be in a relationship with them. So you and me here today, we want to obey Jesus, not out of a sense of duty or compliance, but simply because we love him. And the question becomes, what would God have to do in order to more closely align your heart with his heart? And as we consider that question, the people listening to Jesus here, they were leaning in. They wanted to know more. So he brought the crowd in closer. He brought the disciples in closer so he could explain what he meant about keeping your heart clean. Take a look at verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. After he'd left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach and then out of his body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, comes evil thoughts, 
sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Now, Jesus is saying something really important there. He's saying, guys, isn't it obvious? Isn't it self-evident that what you eat doesn't make you unclean? Because what you eat doesn't even go to your heart. It goes from your hand to your mouth to your stomach and then to the sewer. That's how the body and the digestive system works. So in a sense, he's declaring all things clean here. So when people say, hey, as a Christian, you're not allowed to eat certain foods, just know that here and in the book of Acts, we see that every food has been made clean for us to eat because Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial law of the Old Testament. So just know that you can eat whatever you want. But that doesn't mean that it's always going to be good for you. But biblically speaking, you can enjoy that thick slab of bacon because the problem is not the pork in your belly, it's the pride in your heart, amen? So what's going on inside of you is way more important than what goes into your stomach. If you're taking notes here this morning, I'll ask you to write it down this way, point number two there on your outline. Jesus sees what makes us unclean. He sees. In other words, he sees inside us, into our spiritual heart. So it's extremely important that we don't walk into church just pretending that we got it all together. We're so good at hiding the things that are wrong in order to project the things that are right, things that, that look good. Oh, praise the Lord, I am blessed and highly favored. But listen, I'm not going to talk about the fight we just had in the car on the way to church this morning. Nor am I going to talk about all the struggles I had this week or my own sinful behavior now, I just want to cover all that up. Or I want to look really good on the outside. I mean, I showered and shaved today. I got my good cologne on today. But then we start to see that we're a lot more like the Pharisees than we'd care to admit. This is the human condition. We want to hide what's wrong with us, and we want to project only what's right. This word evil is a very serious word. In fact, we really don't like to use that word today in our modern psychology unless we're talking about something really horrific like a, a terrorist attack or a serial killer. But Jesus said there's actually evil that lurks inside of you. And he lists like 12 or 13 different types of sins that come from the inside. They're thoughts that lead to actions and they defile us. They make us unclean. That's why when you're driving along I-70 or K-10 and somebody cuts you off and all this stuff just comes flying out of your mouth, and you or your wife are wondering where that came from. Jesus said it came from inside of you. It's always there. Which means you can go to Bible study every single day of the week. You can serve lots of people, but you don't get your way at the grocery store. And then you go on that tirade, on that rant, defiling people who are made in the image of God. Listen, that was in you the whole time. It just took one person to bump it out of you. and It just came flowing out, didn't it? Let me tell you, I'll say, me personally, you may not believe this, but I was always so patient and kind before I had kids. <laughs> but then what happened? Well, the kids just revealed the limit of my patience and the limit of my kindness and even some of the evil that was inside of my heart. And listen, if it's true that the only people who can stand before the presence of a holy God are those with a clean hand and pure heart, then I've got to confess to you, I don't stand a chance. I can't wash my hands enough to have a clean heart. I mean, didn't Pilate learn that? If you do something wrong, something you regret, it sticks with you. The guilt, the anxiety, there's something wrong with you, and you don't even know what to call it. Well, back in the day, they knew what to call it. Defilement, uncleanness, impurity. But today, we just struggle, don't we? We wrestle. You know what's interesting? The author of Psalm 24, King David, the writer of the Songs of Israel, who said, who can stand before God, only the person with clean hands and a pure heart? Well, he himself had a moment back in 2 Samuel chapter 11 where he was guilty of every single one of those evils that Jesus lists there in Mark chapter 7. And in a moment, the king, the man after God's own heart, he became one of the most evil, wicked men in the entire Bible. Some of you will remember, he decided to not go out to war with his fellow soldiers. He saw a woman and lusted after her and had sex with her and got her pregnant. And then he tried to cover the whole thing up by having her husband come back from the battlefield, but he himself refused to be with his wife, so David had him killed. And then he tried to pretend that everything was just A-OK. -okay. 
So stop and think that through. In just a matter of weeks, David was guilty of all of these sins. Apathy, pride, entitlement, lust, adultery, abuse of power, theft, deception, manipulation, cover-up, conspiracy, murder, and justification. In fact, Uriah was more honorable drunk than David was sober. And then when Nathan came to him and said, David, you are this man, David realized that he'd been living with the stain of his sin under his priestly robes. And as he reflected back on how he got there and how he might be able to get out, that's where he wrote Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. Earlier, I asked you to mark your place in Psalm 51. Keep your finger there in Mark 7, because we're going to be coming back. But together, let's go to Psalm 51 right now. Let's see what it's like for a person who wants to have clean hands but doesn't. How can they be made clean? I want you to listen to the heart and mind of this king who's stuck. Here's how he begins this song, a song that would be sung for all of Israel, so everybody would know. Psalm 51, beginning in verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. In other words, David's saying there's something seriously wrong with me. Listen, I want to have clean hands. I want to have a pure heart, but I don't. God, I I need you to blot out my my transgressions because you're justified when you judge me. I really do deserve punishment. I deserve hell. And then he says, listen, I was sinful at birth even when I was conceived. What's he saying there? Well, again, because of Adam's sin in the garden, that sin has come to all of us. So we're not born into a sense of purity at all. Sin has already taken root in our hearts and it's just waiting to come out. You parents and grandparents, you know that's why your two-year-old automatically just says mine, right? You don't have to teach them to be selfish. That selfish nature is in all of us. And today, it's a popular phrase that people like to use all the time. They, use, they like to say, well, I was just born that way. They say that to justify the desires of their heart, wherever their desires take them. But when David said, I was born that way, it wasn't an affirmation of the lifestyle that he wants to live. No, it's a cry for mercy. God, please save me from my desires. God, save me from the evil that's lurking in my heart. God, please help me. And as the people of God, if we could be honest, we may even believe that God's forgiven our sin, but yet if we're transparent, we still feel that sense of uncleanness, that sense that we're a fake. That we're a hypocrite. Now, we're going to talk about how God resolves this in a moment, but first let's flip back to Mark chapter 7 because we're going to see Jesus travel to another place where he's going to meet an unclean woman from an unclean country whose daughter is filled with an unclean spirit. Earlier I said that Jesus is going to mess with your religiosity and your religious boundaries. Here he's going to cross a line that so-called religious people would never cross. Not only is he going to destroy the boundary between what's clean and unclean when it comes to food, he's also going to destroy the boundary of what's clean and unclean when it comes to people. Verse 24, Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, verse 27, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. So what is going on here? Well, Jesus travels about 50 miles to this place called Tyre. And he's trying to be in a secret place, but this woman finds out that he's in town. She's desperate. Her daughter is possessed by an unclean spirit. And so she begs him to cast the demon out. And Jesus has this really interesting response here. He was like, well, 
listen, I've come for the children of Israel, so it wouldn't be right to give bread that they deserve to the puppies that are at the table. Wow, what's Jesus doing there? He's actually putting up a barrier, isn't he? Why in the world would he do such a thing? Because remember, in the first part of the chapter, it was the religious leaders who were putting up a barrier. But now, here, Jesus is the one putting up a barrier. Look at her response, though. In her response, she showed that she was not easily offended. She said, oh, yeah, but Jesus, listen, even the puppies get the crumbs that fall from the table. And if I could even just get one crumb of your love and your power, I know that my daughter could be healed. And in Matthew's account, he records Jesus saying, Woman, you have great faith. Your daughter is healed. In all the Bible, Jesus only said that of two people, both of which were outside of the Jewish tradition. So that's really good news for us here today, especially if you're new here. If you're seeking God, but you don't really know any of the songs that we sing, maybe you're struggling to meet some of the people here. Maybe you don't even know where to find Mark in your Bible, let alone what's clean or unclean, what that means. You totally feel like an outsider. Listen, the good news is that Jesus is coming for you. He wants to be in a relationship with you. So if you're willing to not be so easily offended by those other variables, then my friend, you can find salvation and healing and deliverance because that's what Jesus loves to do. Amen? Jesus goes after this woman. He puts up what looks like a barrier, but she just blows right past it. Church, listen, our life aim should be to be just like this woman, to not be so easily offended. What would it look like if the church of Jesus Christ was made up of people who weren't so easily offended, not so easily shut down, not so quick to cancel people or to stop talking to them just because something disrupted their neat little box of what they thought life should be? Jesus wasn't easily offended. And he was able to interact with other people. And this woman, she wasn't easily offended either. And a miraculous thing happened to her because she was desperate and because she was seeking. Now, it's interesting. 30 years after this miracle here, when the Apostle Paul shows up in Tyre in Acts 21, it says then, it says there were many disciples there. So what does that mean? Well, obviously it means that this woman probably shared her story means that this daughter grew up and probably shared her story as well, which is exactly how the gospel moves from person to person and from place to place as people share their stories. Now, in verses 31 through 37, Jesus goes to the Decapolis. Many of you remember that from an earlier story. That's another pagan region that we learned about in a recent study. And there was a guy there who couldn't speak and he couldn't hear. And Jesus said to him, be opened. And immediately he could hear and speak clearly. And the people were like, wow, Jesus does all things well. Now, here's the question for us this morning. If Mark is telling us this story, and if he's talking to us about who Jesus is, then why did he put these first two stories together? You have one group of people who think that they're clean. In fact, they've got 65 pages of hand-washing rules in order to make them clean, but in reality, they weren't clean at all. And then you have another group of people who were unclean. In fact, they lived in pagan areas. This woman whose daughter had an unclean spirit, they know that they're unclean, and they know that they can't make themselves clean, but yet they walk away clean and forgiven, whereas the first group walks away unclean and unforgiven. You see, here today, if you think that you're clean, my friend, you've got a big problem. But if you know that you're desperate for the cleansing of Jesus Christ, then you're in a very, very good place. So quickly, before we close, let's jump back to Psalm 51. This is David's cry. He's in a place where he says, you know what? I'm not going to pretend anymore. I'm not going to keep wearing my nice kingly clothes. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to be honest and let people know that I got a big problem, a problem that's too big for me to fix. No matter how much I try to wash it away, no matter how many times I go to church, no how many times I read the Bible, no matter how frequently I serve other people, I still can't get rid of of the stain. As we read this together, I want you to hear the cry of King David here. Psalm 51, verse 7, David cries, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Verse 9, block out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. In other words, God, you're the only one who can make me clean. 
God, I want you to change my heart. Give me clean hands and a pure heart. Not just a heart that wants, doesn't want to do evil anymore, but a heart that wants to do good. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Renew your spirit in me. Then verse 16, he says, You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. David's just being real. He knows that people are going to read this. He knows they're going to find out what he did. He doesn't care. All he wants to do is just to be right with God. There's absolutely nothing he can do except look up and cry for help. Listen carefully. That's a gospel culture. And here at Lawrence Heights, we need to have a Psalm 51 culture where we're honest about our issues and authentic about what we need and desperate for help, knowing that we can't work our way out of it on our own, knowing that we can never do enough good things to get rid of the stain. So what do we do? We look to Jesus in humility. The opposite of a Psalm 51 culture is a culture that's rigid and legalistic and judgmental, a culture that just points its fingers at people. Listen, if we don't have a Psalm 51 culture here, we'll become the worst of Christianity. Poisonous, toxic, and accusing. And I pray that the Psalm 51 culture just fills this place so that this place will become the safest place in the world for you to be honest and say, I've got issues, man. I do. But thank God for Jesus Christ who washes me clean. Amen? This is what Jesus did when he washed the disciples' feet in John's gospel, chapter 13. He was about to be arrested and crucified, but he takes the time to wash the disciples' feet. And when he begins, he says, you guys don't understand what I'm doing for you now, but one day you will. Remember, it was Peter who said, no way, Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet. But Jesus said, if I don't wash you, then you will have no part of me. Then what did Peter say? He said, well, then give me a whole bath, Jesus. Give it all to me. Friend, listen, you don't clean yourself up and then bring yourself to Jesus. You just come dirty, filthy, and you bring your mess to him and say, Jesus, please clean me. That's the gospel message. That is why he died on the cross. Listen to what John the Apostle said about this and about our response to his grace in 1 John 1, verses 8 to 9. He said, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We talk about forgiveness all the time, but John's saying that there's something that's so much more than that. And it's not just that you're forgiven the debt of your sin, but it's also that he can purify you and totally take away the guilt and the shame of your sin. Third and finally, there in your notes, go ahead and write it down this way. Point number three, Jesus takes away the stain from our story. David repented of all of his horrible sins. And now when you read about him in the New Testament, all those gory details have been left out about him. In fact, Acts 13, 36 says that David served God's purpose in his own generation, and then he fell asleep. Don't miss the gravity of that. That is David's story from God's perspective now. David served God's purpose in his own generation, and then he fell asleep. That's the washing grace of God in our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer together. Father God, please help us to be honest here in this moment. Help us to fully surrender every area of our lives, whether we've been walking with you for 30 or 40 years or even just a few days. We know that you're the God who made us clean. You're the God who's making us clean here in this moment. And you're the God who will make us clean because you say in your word that Jesus is going to present us spotless, without wrinkle, without blemish before you. We thank you, Lord, that we're going to wear robes of white, pure white, cleansed and washed by Jesus' blood. We don't even really know how all that works. We just know that you promised it to us. So we're grateful, Lord. Father, please wash our hearts again here today and remind us of the faithfulness of your promise. And for anybody here who may not yet know the forgiveness and freedom that can only be found in none other than Jesus Christ, Lord, please draw them to salvation right now by your great grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, listen, here's your opportunity.
Here's your invitation to be honest, both with yourself and with God. If you need to be made clean for the first time or maybe for the millionth time, listen, I'd love to pray with you today. If you're ready to surrender your life and place your faith in Jesus, the Bible says repent and be baptized. Today is the day of salvation. You can be washed clean today. Or maybe you have some other need that you just like prayer for. Or maybe you'd like to officially make this your church home. Again, here is your opportunity. I want to invite you to please come forward as we stand and sing this closing song together right now. Thanks again for listening today. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like more information about our church or if you just want to share what God's been doing in your life, drop us a line. Give us a call. Again, may God bless you.